On Saturday, Neymar returned to the Parc des Princes. Not everyone was happy, though, even after Neymar scored one of the goals of the season. Still, boos reigned from a certain end of the stadium. We'll talk about that, we'll talk about Real Madrid, and we'll talk about much more here on the 1970. Hello, listeners. This is ESG Talk contributor Mark Damon, and this is the 1970. I am here, of course, as always, with our editor, Ed, and founder, Ed, and so much more to the site, Ed. Ed, (laughs) how are we doing? I'm doing great. While you were doing that intro, I was actually holding up a sign telling you to go back to Barcelona during the whole thing. The the ultras inspired me. They they were very inspired on on Saturday. Um, they certainly, they were certainly ready to call Neymar a whole bunch of names and Ooh. didn't have very flattering things to say about his father either. Yeah, yeah. But they did uh, win, so I barely. Think we talk about that win first, right? Yeah, so it was a one nil over Strasbourg at home, as you mentioned. Uh, stoppage time winner from Neymar, uh, and what a beauty it was! You had Abdou Diallo, he crossed into the box, and Neymar, with his back to goal, he somehow wrapped his left foot around the ball and directed it in off the post. Incredible goal. Uh, Strasbourg keeper Matt Sells had been a wall pretty much the entire game, uh, just blocking everything. Um, He actually, Neymar should have had a second, but it was called back due to offside. Um, It it was a great end to the game, but I don't know how you feel, but I was kind of meh. (laughs) That was kind of my feeling throughout the whole game. It It wasn't really that great of a game. Like I'm glad we won. It was a great goal, but... For 90 minutes, it was pretty abysmal other than, you know, Keeler Navas had a few couple great saves and you did have that Ander Herrera uh, shot on target, which was great to see as he made his league on debut. Um, But what was your kind of overall feeling for the game? (laughs) Um, It was a coming out of the international break with a big game with two big games on the horizon. Yeah, Leon. Yeah, it it, this team was not quite. into this game the way you'd want them to, but I don't necessarily want to just call it that and not uh, talk about sort of the failures of the coaching and the tactical awareness of that game. Now, it was, again, very clear that a lot of league gun teams are going to do this kind of game plan against PSG. It's not a secret. This is what teams do. They put five, they put five at the back. They compact their midfield. They take away the middle of the field. They force the ball to the outside. They try to hit you on the counter. Strasbourg does that a little bit better than most teams because they've got basically have a football offensive line in that yeah. back. Like yeah. they had guys. They like have a guy Kone. that's like six foot six. Yeah, they had Kone and the Mitrovic, I think. Just big physical bodies. Just hard to get through those guys. And PSG with a limited attack, no Mbappe, uh, Neymar was playing more uh, offensive midfielder. Uh, Di Maria wasn't great. Pablo Sarabia was non-existent. So you pretty much had a team without a lot of attacking options against a team that was putting five at the back and just shutting them down. And for about 60 minutes, Tomas Tugel kind of sat there and watched this. And it was like, meh, not much I can do. Yeah. I mean, eventually they made the changes they needed to make. They, and I'll give them credit for that because it got better after they made the changes. They took out Moting and put on Icardi, who I think provides them with a lot of movement at that nine. You saw when he came in the game, like he's, he's moving. He's trying to make runs. Like Moting doesn't do that because he doesn't know how to do that. Edison Cavani doesn't do it at this point because just his legs aren't like the way they used to be. He's just not as active a player. Um, and that helped. Ander Herrera helped a lot. Mm-hmm. Like taking Sarabia out, putting on Herrera and sort of focusing the attack more on Neymar and Icardi, that helps because there were just too many, there were too many attacking midfielders on the field. There were too many kind of on the ball playmakers and not enough sort of direct threats at goal. So making that adjustment helped, but you know, I don't know why that wasn't made at the beginning of the half. They could have probably gotten a couple of goals if they had done that move earlier. 
I think sometimes there's this thing of we want to wait till the 60th minute, even though, you know, we already knew the answer. I would assume Thomas Tuchel already knew the answer. But waiting wait? that long sort of put PSG in a spot where they had to scramble at the end. And luckily they got it done, but it wasn't very impressive. Although I will say before you go in, defensively, I thought they were very good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, and that's one thing that I had a question about defensively, uh, where you had Diallo, and I mentioned that he was the one who crossed the, the ball into the box for the only goal of the game. But I was just curious, like, what is going on with Presno Kempembe? Can the guy get a game? Is he in in the doghouse with Tuchel? Or, you know, I mean, what, what does this guy have to do? I mean, two years ago, he was one of the best young central defenders in the world, and now he, he can't get a game over Abdu Diallo. I can't figure it out. But as you said, the defense was fine. But well, to be to be honest, he's coming off of a surgery. He's coming off of a semi serious level surgery. So he's been they've been easing him back really okay. carefully over the last couple of weeks and months. So I assume he's gonna play more because Diallo can play off that left side. Yeah. And he showed he was actually not a bad option there in a pinch. You can put him on that left side and he'll get down the field and he'll cross in a game like that. So I, I think Kimpembe will play. I think okay. he'll get games. I don't think, though, that he's better than Abdu Diallo. I thought, like, Abdu Diallo was impressive in this game. He was able to make some good one-on-one plays. His spacing was good. He worked well with Thiago Silva, who, you know, he was he, it was good. It was fine. And I, I looked at that team defensively and I didn't have an issue with it. Yeah. Dagba got an injury, which is a bit concerning because now you have to throw Munier back in. But I mean, at this point, I'd probably even rather Tilo Kerr out there. Oh, that's who I was going to say. Then Thomas Munier. So they do have options defensively. Maybe not all the options are great, but they do have depth and a level of you know, guys, they're not putting out academy players. They're putting out legitimate, you know, European football players. Maybe they're not all excellent, but they they got solid depth back there. I'm not too worried. Yeah, and to that point, when you're speaking about the defense, it all really started for me with Navas. I mean, he he didn't have a ton to do um, in this match. I'm just looking real quick to see how many shots on goal that Strasbourg had. Uh, they had three shots on goal, and it, there was at least two where he was making a diving save where I'm not so sure that Alphonse Areola would have gotten to that. And and that shows you why they he brought he was brought in. Uh, Navas is going to make those saves that very few can do. He had the leadership in the back and. As fans, you weren't really worried about him coming off his line to collect a ball or directing people where to go and, and calling out, you know, someone running into the box. I mean, you, you felt secure in having him back there. And it was nice. We as PSG fans, we haven't had that in a while. So it was great to see well, him back there. <laughs> there's the old Yogi Berra quote that 90 percent of the game is half mental. Yeah. And he's got that level of mentality where you don't worry about it like. The, the defenders are not worried about Kaylor Navas. He'll give up his goals, but they're not concerned with it. And I thought they had that last year with Buffon until he made the mistake in the yeah. United game. They, they had that similar kind of thing where it's like the guy's not going to make a mental mistake. The guy's not going to beat himself. The guy's going to force the other team to make great shots. And that was the thing with Ariola always, which is that he'd get beat by good average shots he wouldn't get it wouldn't take a lot to beat it (laughs) and that's sort of the problem which is you want in these kind of big games you want the other team to have to really work to score and you're not getting a whole bunch of chances so when they get their chances you want to have you know you want to have a situation where they're really having to do some magical things to score and Navas puts you in that situation, and I think that's why he's been so uh, – uh, such a breath of fresh air already because you just see it. Like, he knows how to talk to the defenders. He knows how to be in command. He's been there. There's no questioning his pedigree. There's no questioning if he's good or not. Yeah. And PSG haven't had that maybe since Lama in, like, the 90s. <laughs> like, he's def- Yeah, he's definitely well-respected. You can tell a lot of the players in the locker room all look up to him and – you know, I think that's great to have him at the back. The other thing I wanted to get your thought on is uh, with uh, Chupa Moting starting up front and Neymar right behind him. Was that kind of a little bit of a troll job by Tuchel instead of starting Icardi up there? Like, hey, Neymar, welcome back. Here's the striker that you're going to be feeding balls into. Well, I mean, there were times where Neymar looked like he 
really did not want to be there <laughs> with having to play with a guy like Chopa Moting. It's but a... I, I, I mean, just seriously, though. Chupa Moting helped PSG win two games yeah. in August. That's about what he's good for. Yeah. Like, if he can come in and get a couple of key goals at times and you can rest some guys, he's not supposed to be, like, your your backup striker is not supposed to be a great player. He's just, he's supposed to be a good enough player that they can get him in there. Yeah. So, like, in this game, it just, he wasn't going to score. There was, there was no space. There was no any... Uh, and I don't know, troll job, no, because I just think they wanted to, to ease Icardi back in because he hadn't really played yet for Milan, mm-hmm. and he didn't play. He doesn't play for Argentina because Messi doesn't like him. So <laughs> there, you know, he hasn't played at all. So you know, getting him in for ninety minutes was probably not the best idea. But yeah, and w- one more quick note because we've got some other topics here we want to get to. I just wanted to but, mention the the ultras with the Marquinhos tifo in the beginning. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Was that, yeah. the, was that the ultras or was that the club making that? It could have been the club. I don't. Whoever put it up, kudos to you. There was a great picture from the club uh, on their Instagram at PSG. If you go and check it out, it's like an aerial shot. You can see the Eiffel Tower off in the distance. There's like giant Marquinhos, and you can see the park. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful shots oh, that they've ever posted. Think- he, he deserves it. Of all those guys, he, he certainly does deserve that. And and he, his reaction, you know, he had his daughter and his wife there and they were watching it. And then he had to like get his phone out and get a picture. I don't think he knew it was coming and he was kind of taken back. He tweeted about it. So if any guy on uh, any player at PSG deserves it, it's certainly him. Um, he's one of my favorite players. So I just wanted to mention that. Um and then in that TIFO, Marquinhos was wearing the new third kit. I know that you don't really get into all the kit news, but um, just real quick, the new kit was released ahead of Saturday's match. Um, kind of mistakenly, or maybe not so much, Neymar uh, spoiled the news in his Instagram story where he had like a little video and he was wearing it. And I believe DJ Snake, um, in his Instagram story, he had the shirt on too. So everyone knew the kit was coming. I, I even think uh, ESPN FC's Jonathan Johnson had mentioned that it was kind of anticipated. Um, but it's a retro look. It's a white kit. It's got the red and blue strip um, off center to the side. It's got the throwback Nike logo on it. Um, Nike's done a few of these throwback jerseys, uh, throwback kits, but I think this one is the best one. And I like how PSG, when they put it out, they did like a side by side where PSG players today and then they're posing like a player from the past. So like Neymar posing like Ronaldinho. So I think I think the kit is amazing. I'm gonna get one. The site was down. When I was trying to buying one, but I- I'll have to circle back and do that. But well, you should have been more kit. consistent because I was able to get one the day it went on. You, you know? were so I kept trying, and then I got tied up with other things, so I wasn't able to purchase one yet. I also love the warm up kit, or that's not a kit, but the warm up shirt. It's like blue, and it's also retro. So the, the whole collection is fantastic. No, I I bought it. It's 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 as good a jersey as advertised. And again, you know, I, again, I don't care so much about it because I, I I care more about how they play in them rather than how they, you know, I don't wear jerseys as a fashion statement. Like, yeah. But I think that one's really good looking. It's really got the it's got that vibe to it, and I think the fans appreciate that. I I I sometimes don't uh, sell this enough. I don't make a you know a big deal out of it. But you know what? Giving the fans a kit that they like mm-hmm. and giving the fans a kit that kind of harkens back to another time in the club's history, those are things that you should do. It, make, it makes people happy. And you want a fan base that's happy. You know, you want fans that are invested. You want to give them something, you know, you want to give them a reward. Yeah, and I feel like yeah. they've had to deal with some pretty average kits over the years you know, since the QSI era. And I think this is one of them that it, it, it gives them something to wear with pride and they'll be wearing it for years to come. And you'll be seeing, you know, those kits you see in the stands that are, you know, 10, 15 years old, even <laughs> older than that. This will be one of those kits that those fans, you know, 20 years from now, they'll still be wearing it. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Nobody's wearing, nobody's wearing that. There might be like two people, but there's no one wearing that yellow road kit that they that they had a couple years ago or you know nobody yeah. wearing those like nobody's gonna wear the road kit from last year but people will wear this one so you know i give psg credit for it 
Yeah, especially, I mean, some of the older fans, the changes to the crest where they remove some things and change things around and they feel like kind of losing the identity. You talked about some of the older kids, maybe aesthetically not as pleasing, but they also were kind of a, a departure from the traditional, you know, home kit. You know, they really have gotten away from from the traditional design. So the, going back, paying homage to the kits of the 90s, I think excellent touch um and we've already talked way too much about this this is a, a topic for our 24th and park podcast so we'll let those guys uh handle that one but um, i just want to get your uh thoughts on that so um let's just keep it rolling so in addition to the third kit we're gonna step away a little bit from things going on the field and talk about off the field so there was a report that came out and this was from cies football observatory really don't know what that is anyway they have said that Manchester City have are the most valuable squad in history, and they they put them at the first billion euro squad. Uh, PSG came in second with 913 million euros spent on their squad. Um, and, and as you read through the piece, it, I thought it was interesting to learn that Monaco received the most amount of money for its players between 2010 and 2019. They pulled in just over a billion euros from player sales. Obviously, Mbappe to PSG was a big part of that. Um, another French club mentioned was Lille. They had the most positive net balance for tra- transfers. And English Premier League clubs, they had a total net negative balance of 6.5 million euros. So the French clubs are making money. Um, Premier League clubs are spending money. And Manchester City, just reminder, billion euro squad, zero champions league trophies and they are rarely critiqued for that i guess because they have pep and they're in the premier league and people give them a pass whereas psg are second and they are constantly reminded that they haven't won the most difficult trophy to win so what are your thoughts on some of these staggering numbers um i would say that it's not surprising that psg have a squad with that's worth that much money quite frankly they should Mm-hmm. Um, they, they have enough money to spend. They've, uh, they, it shows that they do have players of quality. And I think that in the long run, you know, they're going to be in the top five of that list. They're not always going to be one or two. They may be four or five. They may be one at times, but it shows that there is a health to it, that they're able to afford that sort of wage, you know, that sort of value. And I, again, I'm a little, less, I'm not, confused but a little confused is it more about how much money those players are getting paid or how much they're actually worth in ve- in theoretical value yeah so it was i believe it's like how much that they had spent so i'm looking here the english champion leads the way 1.014 billion ahead are we of talking about up their transfer fee or their wages it says Manchester City has become the first club in the history of football to invest more than one billion euros on transfers of players that make up its current squad. OK, that makes that makes a little more yeah. sense than what we're talking about. So, yeah, PSG spend a lot of money. Big deal. Manchester yeah. City spend a lot of money. Big deal. And right now, I again, it, it's not as nec- in, you know, in the, in the long run, it's not as much about how much you spend. It's how much you pay. And I know Barcelona, I think, is at the top of that wage bill list. It's why they couldn't sign Neymar. So they just they're yeah. paying everybody else ridiculous amounts of money. And it's kind of like you And I will, I will stick by it. It does show that there's a health to, health to the club. I think French football as a whole would do better if they could balance out that a little more and not, you know, sell all of their players left and right because. I mean, Monaco sold a billion dollars worth of players, and they a, have a billion uh, euro. A yeah, euro, yeah, a billion euros worth of players, and they have one league gun trophy to show for it, and all that time, like, and then they immediately sell all their good players after they win that league gun title, and now they're what 18th in the league. Yeah, they're struggling again to to you know break the relegation fight. So that doesn't mean a lot to Monaco. What has that million done for them? It's kept them in business, I guess. So- <laughs> So for for the past decade, Monaco has pulled in a billion euro through player sales. They are currently 19th out of 20 in Liga. Yeah, where 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 is the money going? We do exactly. Where where is that money going? It's going to what? Keita Balde and and Yuri Tielemans. It's like yeah, like come on now. If you you know, Thierry Henry's buyout. Yeah, it's it, it, what you know. What are you doing with them? Why? The, to me, it's not a big deal if they're spe- they're making money if they can't 
invest it back into the club in the right way. They still play in that stadium that sits like what 15,000 people and they can't even fill that. Isn't it like built on like a shopping mall or like a parking garage or something? It's weird. They need to like, they're not, to me, it's weird because they're not even in, they're not even in France. They're in that principality. So they should have some sort of unique advantage of being in a city that a lot of rich people go to, Mm -hmm. but they can't really attract tourists. Like tourists don't go to see Monaco play. Like they go to the casinos. I know tourists go to see Paris St. Germain. Yeah. They don't go to see Monaco. I I don't want this to become Monaco talk, but like, (laughs) you know, it, it, I, I don't look at those those kind of figures very much, and that's why I'm not sort of in like it's a, it's a topic we talk about it, but to me it's like so what if PSG spend money? They should spend money if they can if they can spend the money without you know breaking financial fair play rules. They should spend the money. Like, I, I want to be in that value level. I want to go through all of the recent articles that came out after Manchester City lost to Norwich City, and I want to go through all of those articles and see how many times they mention Manchester City also known as the most expensive squad ever assembled, lost to Norwich, a newly promoted side. Because you know with Neymar, like, PSG lost with Neymar in the squad, who is also the most expensive transfer. I mean, any time that they can take a shot at Neymar and PSG for spending money and losing, they do it. But Manchester City somehow gets a pass on all this. They are a billion-euro squad. They just lost to Norwich City, a newly promoted side. Yeah, that's different. The Premier League's the toughest league. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a huge difference between yeah. Norwich and and Saint Etienne. I, I really, I don't buy it. Well, no, you're you're right. It's bull. It's bullshit. But that that's the that's the narrative. It's been the narrative, and there's not much that's going to change that. So I, I don't know about getting caught up on it because I I I've gotten to a point where it's like PSG just have to go out there and prove it on the field. They that they can do no more than that. They're not this gonna they're true. not gonna change the the court of public opinion any other way but winning and even after they win there'll be some you know they'll win the champions league and the topic on espn fc will be was ps you know it uh, what's his name will go well craig burley <laughs> was psg's champions league tainted and then burley will go into how it was tainted and how other players got hurt and how it was a fluke and you know and it'll it, they'll they'll do that and then the the the, the wheel will keep turning that was a brilliant Dan Thomas uh, yeah. impersonation. <laughs> um, speaking of Dan Thomas, he used to work for Real Madrid, so we're going to go to their rivals. We're going to talk about Barcelona and Messi. So Messi had a rare interview over the international break. Uh, he had an interview with Sport. And in that interview, he had some comments about PSG and Neymar. So I'm going to read through some of these quotes, and then you just tell me what you think about this, and I'll I'll follow you up. So he said, I don't know if Barca did everything possible for Neymar's return. He went on to say, but it is true that negotiating with PSG is not easy. He then said, I would have loved for Neymar to return. He is one of the best players in the world. And at the image level and sponsors, we would have taken a leap that would have given us stability. What do you make of those comments? He's right. And I think it's, if we didn't know by now, I think it's pretty clear that the driving force behind getting Neymar back was Lionel Messi. Interesting. And it does show sort of how powerful he is that Barcelona, with pretty much no available capital to actually sign Neymar, still were able to get as close as they were based solely off of trying to please their Lord and Savior Lionel Messi, and well, it kind of shows it, how much he runs that club. He in the piece, club, he runs it. In the piece, he did say that they never really asked Barca. They did not. He didn't command or anything. I mean, that's what he's saying oh, publicly. Oh, bull, bull, oh stop! <laughs> I'm oh, just saying that's what he it. said. Of course, he, no, he's lying. Of course, that's why. Do you you mean someone who doesn't Barcelona, pay their taxes is lying? Barcelona had no plans on doing this until. Messi was able to recruit Neymar into going along with this or the people that are around Neymar. And that's the only reason this went forward. Bartomeu didn't want to do this, I don't think. I don't think Bartomeu was so excited about, like, hey, let's get this guy back who screwed me over two years ago. Like, wh- why would he want to do that? Why would Especially he wanna- when Neymar is, like, on, like, he had two injuries. So he He's is at the lowest the in his career. Why would- he's suing the club. He was suing the club for payment 
of a clause in his contract that they pulled. So, again, who was who's running what here? Like, Messi wanted him. That's why they went after him. Go on with the next quote. <laughs> that was it. Those are all the quotes. So, that he also... That's all uh, you had to say? That was... Let me just pull it up. He said... It's true that negotiating with PSG is not easy. Well, we saw that with Verratti. You came for him and you got nothing, and then you came for Neymar and you got nothing. So, yeah, negotiating with PSG is not easy. They don't allow you to manipulate them with the media and just give in to whatever you want like every other La Liga team does. Exactly, or <laughs> any other team does. Now, here, here's the part that I thought was most interesting where he mentioned that the image level and sponsors – I think Barcelona could potentially be in trouble. They have really, you know, they've signed some young players and they're kind of banking on them to turn into kind of global superstars because Messi is, let's let's be honest, I mean, he's great and all, but he's not going to be around for too much longer. Barcelona needs that next, you know, is is Frankie Dion that person? I don't know, but they're they're certainly banking on him to be that. So... Maybe Messi is trying to bring Neymar in to kind of bridge that gap when he goes, have Neymar there, and then some of the other younger players will be ready to take over when Neymar's finished. I thought that was an interesting part of the quote. Well, maybe. I don't know he's thinking too much about that. I think when Messi retires, he's going to go live in some, you know, I think he's just going to go away and live in some massive mansion somewhere and not really do much of anything because he doesn't really have to. And I think that, He's not concerned. I don't think he's concerned about the future of the club. I think he's concerned about winning more Champions Leagues before he leaves his prime, which, yeah. you know, hell, hell knows when his prime's going to end because the guy's been the guy's been great for so long. But, you know, he is picking up more injuries as he's gone along. The, you know, he's he's out injured right now and he's not going to be that way forever. I mean, he could be, you know, soccer players usually reach their pro, the end of their prime in their early 30s. So. I think he's thinking, hey, I want to win a Champions League again. I want to go out, you know, I, we're winning La Liga all the time because Real Madrid sort of isn't in a great place. But, like, hey, I want to win a Champions League again. And Neymar's my easiest path think, to do that instead of carrying these 16-year-olds and <laughs> Usman Dembele and Antoine Griezmann, who I, I – the more I see him there, the more I think that's going to be a failure. But, yeah. like – you know, I think that's what he's thinking right now. I think Neymar gives him that better chance to do that. I mean, there was a quote that he said, Barcelona is my home and I don't want to leave, but I want to win and I want to win the Champions League. It's been a long time since we won it. You know, could PSG sign Messi? No, I mean, no, would no, that no, be incredible topic. next no, summer? Ne- no, next topic. Next topic. You know, no. PSG, just throw an offer in for him just to piss him off. Just do it. Yeah, just do I, it. I, I, I could I could live with that. OK. We're gonna talk. We're gonna go back to Real Madrid. So we, you know, uh, on Wednesday we've got the big Champions League match day one. Uh, last time we faced Real Madrid in Champions League was 2018, I believe it was. We lost 3-1 in the first leg and had to overcome that deficit with Neymar out injured. Then we went on to lose 2-1, and Madrid actually went on to win the entire tournament. I don't think it's really fair to judge this year's matchup on that last performance. You know, Madrid are without Cristiano Ronaldo. We have Navas. Um, I was I was kind of keeping one eye on Real Madrid this weekend. Uh, they played Levante. Uh, Eden Hazard, he, he's still making his way back from injury. I saw that he did play, but he didn't start. Um, Kareem Benzema, he scored a brace. He's a player that I'm definitely worried about. Um, how do you see this one playing out? If you want to give me a potential lineup or how do you, how do you, how, what is your overall feeling? going into this it's a little bit weird considering what we just had against Strasbourg and then kind of switching gears and going into a big match against Real Madrid with you know Neymar is not going to be able to play we don't know if Mbappe is going to be able to make it back um he's he's getting back into training we hope uh Cavani is looking like he could potentially be there Icardi is going to be there so what what is your overall feeling going into this match I'm going to be blasphemous here I don't think this game is a big deal Hmm. I think it's the first game I would have rather this game been on the road because you you know you want you don't want to sort of have a home game where you're that where you're kind of an underdog in this in this tournament. But PSG, barring disaster, <laughs> are going to get through this this group. They just are. Uh, Galatasaray will give them some difficulty a little bit. Bruges isn't going to give them difficulty at all. 
PSG are going to get the points they need out of those games, and they're going to qualify through. So this is more about, I think, a test early to see how Tomas Tuchel tactically approaches this. I think that's the really only interesting part. I don't really think that this is a, a big deal for these players. It, it, to, I don't. I don't judge the players really off this game. I think that, you know, we, you can get into some of it. Ta- you know, who you know, balance out who has what. I think Real Madrid's attack is stronger right now. They'll have Hazard. They'll have Benzema. They'll have Jovic. PSG are obviously without the guys they need to have. PSG I think has a stronger midfield right now. Luka hmm. Modric is out with an injury. Tony Cross has been uh, hit or miss. Ernesto Valverde, I think, is their other guy, and I think he's been hurt a little bit. Casemiro has been sort of on the decline a bit, and defensively, it's kind of a wash. Yeah. So, and in goalkeeper, I would give PSG the advantage over, I'd give Navas over Courtois, ironically enough. Mm. So, you know, this game could be 2-0 Real Madrid, it could be 1-1, PSG might be able to steal a, a, a victory here, but I don't see this as being really indicative of anything. It's almost like Champions League warm up in a way. Mm. Like they need to get their feet wet a bit. They need to they need to play well enough for what they're going to have on the field. I'm not saying they can just go out there and lay a stinker because they can't do that. But if they lose this game, it's not the end of the world. You know, if they win this game, it's not the end of the world. It it you can't I think tell a lot with especially without Neymar and probably without Kylian Mbappe yeah it's hard to tell a lot so it's the, the I said as I said the real I think interesting part of this will be what Thomas Tuchel does more than anything else or how he comes out and approaches the game that I think is really more interesting than actually what happens on the scoreboard in, in the words of the great Michael Scott, every time we start a Champions League campaign, I just think of that quote where he's like, no doubt, I am ready to get hurt again. And that's kind of how I feel <laughs> every year as we're getting ready to go into the Champions League. It's like, how is this going to blow up? Um, but we got to stay positive. We are PSG talk after all. So going into Wednesday's game, I'm a little bit different. I think it's a big deal. I want us to be competitive. Um, I don't want us to go out there and play like Strasbourg for 90 minutes. And we're just kind of kicking it around and being lazy. I want people to get up for this game. Forget about who can't play and focus on who can play. I'm going to be looking at Tuchel, and I want to see how he lines up. I want to see who he starts. Does he go with Cavani if he's available? Or does he go with Cardi, who's maybe still settling in, but definitely has uh, he's not coming off any injuries. So I'm looking at Tuchel. I want to look at just the overall feeling of the squad as they're out there. Are they up for it? Are they playing with a lot of passion? Are they pressing? Does it look like they have a game plan? Um, I think there's a lot of things as a supporter that I want to see. I want to see them be able to switch that gear from league on play to Champions League. And I want them to put everyone on notice. They have this great attack, which obviously is not going to be on display in this game, but people are starting to expect things from PSG this season now that they brought in these signings. I mean, Navas didn't come here to just finish second to the team he just left. He's going to want to win, and I want to see how he's motivating players. And so I think there's a lot on the line here. Um, Will it impact, ultimately, whether they advance out of the group? Probably not. I think there's some other games that they can win and be able to advance, no problem. I think this game is more of a statement, and they need to put the rest of Europe on notice and say, hey, PSG is here. Look what, what we just did to Real Madrid without Neymar, without Mbappe. I think that's more important to reset that narrative of PSG being losers to, oh shit, they, they're they actually really good and they didn't even have their best players. So I think from that point of view, it's important. Yeah, I guess. But I uh, again, you, you're you taking out Neymar and Mbappe and you're expecting them to make some sort of statement. I don't think it's going to be that. I just think they, I, I think the statement to be made is that they're tactically disciplined, that they're sound in what they're trying to do. Like, mm-hmm. I think that's the, the, that's what they, they need to look competent. Yeah, they're, I would agree. They're not going to, they're not going to be, they're not going to score five goals. They're not going to, they're not going to overwhelm Real Madrid, but they definitely can have the, they definitely can have a midfield advantage in this game. They can have, you know, 40 to 45% possession. I don't think they're going to get blown out in that way. It's just, are they going to be able to score goals? And 
it looks like Real Madrid are going to be able to score the more goals because they have the better attacking players. Now, we'll see how that ends up going, but you can't, I think... I don't know. I, I don't think you can take a lot from this game. I just don't see it that way. I mean, you brought in Idrissi Gay for a game like this. You brought in Navas for a game like this. And those are two players that are going to start. And I want to see them. You know, I think Gay can hold down that midfield. Like you said, I think PSG do have the better midfield. Can they win the ball and spark an attack? I think Angel Di Maria is probably going to start. And he is a more than confident. Well, who else should start? Yeah, I, I yeah. mean. He has to start. I I, I yeah. think it's pretty clear that Icardi and Di Maria are going to start up top. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to have Sarabia probably on a wing. I don't I, know. I, that I, didn't I, work. I, I, would, I, would, I don't know. I, I think they need to get – my personal opinion is they need to get Herrera, Verratti, yes. and Gouillet on the field together. Yep. Because I think that's when they're at their best. I think you load up that midfield. I'd play something like a 4-2-2, shift it over a little bit, and – you know, be solid in the back. Marquinhos and Silva would be nice. I mean, you're you're naming these players, and I think that is enough to be competitive and have plenty of attacking. I mean, you've got Cavani potentially, Icardi, well, can Di you Maria. Play a, well, that's interesting. Can you play Cavani and Icardi together? I don't know about that. That does, I don't know if that works. And then if you've got if you've got Verratti behind them, Herrera behind them, and Gay behind them, I, it's not a bad lineup. I mean, I think they could really you know put Real Madrid to the sword and 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 get people to start asking questions of Zidane and I saying, mean, hey, what's going on here? You know, did you're you get more the optimi- you're more optimistic about it than I am, but. <laughs> I know this is all going to blow up my face. I was also the one. All I want is competence. That's what I'm looking for. They just have to survive this game and not just completely destruct. And then you can get on to the game against Galatasaray and you can, you can move forward. I honestly, I think the Leon game is going to be more Mm. indicative of how this team's going to play. Cause you assume that Killian Mbappe will play at least a little bit of that game, if not the Mm. whole game. And then you have, Neymar in the game, Accardi will be there for the full time. Maybe Cavani will be in there too. I think that game will be more indicative of how this PSG team will look come the winter and spring than this game will. I would agree. I um, I just want to see a Juan Bernat Tifo. Give the man his due. I mean, he <laughs> deserves it. I would agree. So we'll see what the fans can pull out. I think it's going to be a great atmosphere. I'm excited for it. Um, I'll be watching. I'll be tweeting. So make sure you follow at PSG Talk. Um, Mark, let's move ahead to our main event. This is something I know you have been going back and forth on Twitter with some fans. You have a lot of opinions about this. I have some of my own opinions, but I'm going to let you take the lead on this one and share what you think. Um, but it's the no, ultra. I, you know what? I oh. want to hear what you I want to hear okay. what you think first. All right. I'll go first. I haven't, so really heard your, your, I haven't really heard your thoughts on it. I kind of want to hear what you have to say about it without okay. me sort of. And I, I've gone back and forth, so let me just set it up. So we're going to be talking about the ultras treatment of Neymar. Leading up to the match on Saturday, Collectif, Ultras Paris, they put out a note about Neymar saying that they would treat Neymar with indifference, but starting after the match against Strasbourg. So essentially they are planning to give him a bunch of shit for 90 minutes, which they did, and then move on after that. Um, after the match, Neymar had this to say, if they want to boo me, they should go ahead. He went on to say, I know that I will be playing every match as if we were away from home. And I want to say that I have no problem with the fans. Um, A couple more Neymar quotes. He said, everyone knows that I wanted to leave. I had personal reasons for it. It was not against the institution that is PSG. When you do not feel happy in one place, you want to leave. I did everything I could, uh, but they did not want me to leave. My head is with PSG. I'm going to give everything on the pitch, and I'm completely focused here. I am going to give everything I have, like I have done at every club I've been. That is my job. And that um, translation of those post-game quotes were from uh, Get French Football News, and appreciate them putting that up. So that kind of sets the stage. He wanted to leave. He finally admitted it after a long time. The ultras, a certain section of them, were unfolding banners and signs. Some of them, I thought, crossed the line. We won't get into that. I'm not going to repeat what some of those. It's all over Twitter. Um, Every time Neymar touched the ball, he was whistled and booed. I thought as the game went on, that kind of died down a little bit. My my feeling is this. I feel... 
he essentially admitted he wanted to leave the club. And he said they were for personal reasons. Maybe he really does miss playing with Messi. Um, I feel like as fans, if you want to whistle him and say it's just for one match, go ahead. I think they have the right to do that. I don't agree with some of the banners and some of the language. I don't think that should be at a football match. But if you want to whistle him and let him know that you are displeased with what he did and tried to orchestrate a transfer and say that he wanted to get out of Paris so much that he wanted to pay his money out of his own pocket to try to get back to Barcelona, I can understand how that would upset a lot of fans. And I think probably on some of these past podcasts, I've said, get out of the club, you damaged goods and whatever. So I can understand that frustration. But you gave him some shit for one game, treat him with indifference going on forward. If he pulls off more goals like that, celebrate it. That's fine. But you let them know you're unhappy. Let it go away and get behind this team and support everyone, because I think we could do something really special. But that can only happen if the if the fans are behind this team collectively and we're not booing one player every time he touches the ball for the rest of the season. You know, everyone has had their say now. Neymar knows that you're unhappy with him. Let's be the bigger person and cheer him and encourage him because he's motivated to do well because he was coming off of two injury riddled seasons. He wants to perform well. So let's get behind him. And hey, if he wins us the Champions League and moves on, I think we can all live with that. So that's kind of my feeling on it. Yeah, um, I I think that's a reasonable take. And I look at this sort of in a simple way. I don't know. It's not simple. It's it's compl- This is always complicated, and it's stupid, and it's silly, and this should never have come to any of this, and we shouldn't be where we are now, but here we are, so let's deal with what we have. The Ultras are a vocal minority of the PSG fan base, and the more that PSG grows as a club and an institution, the more that the ultras become even more of a minority of this club on all seven continents, even Antarctica. There are, this club has a wider reach than it has ever had before. And to a certain degree, the very concept of ultras is of a very different era in the sport. Like, when these clubs used to be much more provincial than they are, these sort of ultra groups would be the heartbeat of the club. And to a certain degree, they still are. But in this case, I think what is happening is there's a battle here between your heart and your head. And maybe more about maybe more than your heart, your gut, your head versus your gut. And as much as we like to try to talk intellectually about sports and bring in analytics and talk about the numbers and show heat maps and, you know, passes per game and all that happy stuff. In the end, we react with our gut. It's what we feel, that initial feeling when you see something and you react, that's the reaction. Everything else is you either trying to rationalize it or come up with something to Make it go, make that feeling go away to make yourself either sound smarter or make yourself not or make yourself less vulnerable. And you'll see it on Twitter a lot. A lot of these people that follow the club on Twitter, they react with their their gut, not their head. And they say things that are silly and overreactionary and stuff they don't mean. And that is part of it. There's the other part of it where that reaction goes the other way, where even if you hate somebody, even if you're booing the guy consistently, he'll do something spectacular. And you in your gut, in your I mean, in your head, you know that you don't want to cheer that guy. But God damn, did he just do something special? Like there's that part of it, too. Like. You know, we've been watching in the United States this football player named Antonio Brown make a complete ass out of himself for the last, you know, month and a half. And even worse at this point. But the guy's still a great athlete. And when you see him on the field, you're still amazed by his athleticism and his skill and his ability. 
And Neymar is in that similar vein where it's like, yeah, the guy, the guy is what he is, flaws and all. He's a dynamic athlete, but he's also a pain in the ass. He's also a coward. He's also petty. He's also somebody who cannot stand to be unhappy even for one second for the greater good. He is selfish in that specific way. He does not want to be sad. And you know what? If you're going to try to live your life for all of it without ever being sad or ever having to go through adversity or ever having to do any of that stuff, that's a tough life to live because you're always going to be disappointed. And Neymar, in this case, laid it out pretty clearly, I think, actually. The dude wants to be happy. Mm -hmm. And he, like, you know, people like him who have grown up, you know, who grew up as celebrities, they chase those highs. They chase that happiness in a way that's unhealthy. And some people, you know, do it with drugs and alcohol. Some do it with other ways of coping, other ways of, you know, of acting out, you're never going to be normal being that kind of child celebrity. You're just, it's never going to happen. So yeah, he's been through a lot and don't worry, this is going somewhere. He's been through a lot. He's had adverse. This has not gone the way he's wanted it. And you know what? He wanted to leave. And you know what? There are some people in this world who have a job and they want to go do something else full time. So they quit that job and they go do the other thing full time. Now, whoever those people may be, they have their reasons, but we don't, you know, yell at, we don't go, you know, if somebody quits their job at Sears or, or Sam's club or Walmart to go somewhere else, we don't, you know, the people at Walmart don't go to that person's house and hold up signs that call them a traitor and a loser and a prostitute. <laughs> that's not how life works. No. But for some reason with our sports teams, that's how we react. Because it's not with our head, it's with our heart and it's with our gut. So these ultras feel insulted. They feel like Neymar spit on them and he spit on the club. And to a certain degree, by the way he went about it, he yes. did. Absolutely. Yeah. But... And it yeah. Go ahead. No, and I, that's the point where I would 100% agree with the ultras. Neymar handled this terribly. In his quote, he said that when you do not feel happy in one place, he's unhappy in Paris because he's had two seasons where he's been injured. Maybe he doesn't like the weather. If he came out and said, hey, guys, I gave you everything I had and I, these injuries have me down. I don't love the city. I'm sorry. I can't do it anymore. If he was just honest and came out. I don't think the ultras would be that upset if he wasn't able to orchestrate a move and stayed with the club. Cause at least we would then know why, but he kind of left everyone in the dark and we could only assume like he just didn't want to be here. It's too hard. And he wants to go back and exactly. people made a lot of assumptions. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. That's why he should have said something because you have to set your own narrative. You can't allow the narrative to be set for you. Mm -hmm. And I think Neymar thought that this was the best way to go about it or the, the easiest way, not the best, but the easiest way where he wouldn't have to say anything, he could make his move, he could leave in the middle of the night, he wouldn't have to say goodbye, all that stuff. It didn't happen. But here's the thing. It's over now. That happens. It's over. So it's September. We're going to have to go all the way to May, hopefully late May, early June, if PSG make it all the way to the Champions League final. So that's what, nine months? So you are telling me that these ultras are going to sit in those stands and boo Neymar for nine months and sing Edinson Cavani like a bunch of marks, like a bunch of CM Punk marks at the, at the wrestling show where the guy's been gone for five years and they're still chanting for CM Punk like he's going to come back when he's never coming back. Like, they're going to do that and they're going to make fools of themselves by doing that over and over again. Is that their plan? Because it's a sucky plan. Because in the end, most fans who don't think with their head are going to think with their heart and they're going to think with their gut. They're going to see that guy doing marvelous things for the club and helping the team win. And they're going to cheer for him. Yeah. Because that's what fans do. Fans are fickle. That's what fans do. They cheer for the people that they, you know, they cheer for people if they help them win. They boo if they don't. 
that's how this works. So, yes, today, Saturday was a very cathartic experience for a lot of those fans. They needed to go out there and boo him to his face. But once he scores, and once he starts contributing, and more importantly than that, once he starts showing you that he's invested in playing, which is clear he is, he wasn't. He has to be. He has to be invested. He wasn't dogging it on Saturday. He played hard. He was one of their best players. He was yeah. probably one of their top two players on the field. The guy was invested. So at what point do you go, all right, we're not going to love the guy. But if he scores goals for us and helps us win games, we're going to cheer because that's human nature. Are we going to are we going to go on a strike for the next nine months because the guy tried to leave? Again, it just to me, it seems like you're biting off your nose to spite your face. And somehow the ultras made Neymar, who is really to blame in all this, they made him look like the bigger person with some yes, of his clothes. They made him look like the bigger person. Like they're sitting there calling him, you know, prostitute, go back, this, that. And he's like, my head is with PSG and I'm going to give everything on the pitch. They made him look like the bigger person, even though he's the one to blame for the whole thing. They made him look sympathetic. Yeah, exactly. Because let's be realistic. People are petty. People have short-term memories. This is 2019. We don't remember things that happened three weeks ago. Like, that's how this society works now. We don't remember stuff. So in a month from now, most PSG fans aren't even going to remember this. Honestly, they're just not. Like, they're going to want to see PSG win. They're going to want to see Neymar score. Like, that's just how life works. And no one's asking you to sing his name. No one's asking you to buy his jersey. Just don't boo him with every touch. If he scores a goal, you know, clap your hands and move on. You don't have to be like a crazed fanatic. Get, get the get the mute button ready, but it's petty as fuck. <laughs> this is okay. This is the 1970. We can cuss. It's fine. Okay. Okay. They, all right. They're, they're petty as fuck <laughs> at this point. And it's like, it's okay. F- and this is also part of my point too, which is to tie it all together. Is What are the ultras? What is their mission here? What's the point of them being here? Is the point of them being here to be the vocal support for PSG in big matches and to support the team and to bring that energy and to bring that passion? Or is their goal to get themselves over and to be like a real organization that has like code and ethics? It's like, what are you? And if your plan is to sort of be the moral compass of PSG, Man, that that train left the station a long time ago, man. <laughs> like, you, you you're not bringing that back. Like, this isn't the 1990s anymore. This we all know what we we all know as fans what we've got ourselves into supporting PSG. We what love the this club. Is. Yeah. Like, you're not gonna you're not going to be the moral compass here. There is no you know there is none of that. PSG are gonna do what they're going to do. They're going to expand the way they want to expand. And if that means the ultras kind of get left behind a little bit, that's what that means. And in the end, I feel like Neymar is going to contribute. He's going to play hard. He is going to give his 100% effort. You do not have to like him. But as, you know, the the one fan on Twitter, the one fan that they they interviewed, and I got, I think, from, you know, that, that one of the fans said, you know, hey, we would have rather to draw than Neymar score that goal. And, at that, and once you get to that point, where you, and it's ironic because I believe they were saying no one player is bigger than the club, you are now making one player bigger than the club. Yeah, that's By a good point. That, you're saying that our hatred of Neymar overshadows our love for PSG. And I, I've talked for 15 minutes now. <laughs> I could have just said that and we'd be done. Does your hatred for Neymar overshadow your love for PSG? And when those two come in conflict, which one is going to win out? Hopefully your love for PSG wins out, as opposed to your hatred for a player that, at this point, he's stuck there, you're stuck with him, make the best of it, try to win the Champions League, and move on. That's just, and I think them not moving on is a sign of them being petty, at this point and not understanding that everyone else is going to move on here. Do you see the players? Did the players, did the players celebrate with them? I think they did. Oh, all of them. All of them did. 
They don't hate him. They like the guy. They understand that it's a business. Like at some point, you're just you're you're doing this for the sake of pride and stubbornness, as opposed to anything that sort of is based off of any real value to to the club. Yeah. It doesn't help the club. You know, them protesting like this isn't help the club. It just makes them look, you know, it, I keep saying petty, but it makes them look that way. And it makes them look like fans that you wouldn't want to play for. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to be interesting. Play? It's going to be interesting on Wednesday, Champions League, everybody watching, everyone's tuned into that one, what they do. Do they let it go after Saturday or do they think, oh, we have well, a global audience. Let's really he's not give it playing. So, yeah. Well, I mean, he, is he allowed in the stadium? I mean, can they still have banners and things like that? Uh, I don't think he'll be at the sta- I don't think he'll be in the stadium. He'll be I, I don't playing see him poker at home or something. I don't see him being in the stadium. He, I mean, he might. But at that point, though, are you really concerned about a guy that's not there in the game? Like, that's what I, I hope they don't. I hope he's not even mentioned. Yeah, like just support your club. That's yeah. what you're there for. You're there to support your club, not to be some sort of puritanical governing body of what is and isn't loyalty like that that's where i think this gets ridiculous which is like are we is that what they're there for what are they there for and and to that point if you switch it around the other way and you talk about loyalty i mean <coughs> have you been all that loyal to alphonse Ariola? i mean and there's other players some of those youngsters that were shipped off i mean where are the ultras holding up the why did you sell musa diaby and all that you know what i mean like Loyalty goes both ways. Sure, maybe Neymar wasn't the most loyal this summer, but and they're vocal about that. But when you flip it around, do they say things when PSG maybe aren't that loyal to some of the players? Do they let go? No. I, again, I think this is personal, and that's yeah. where I think that you you have to get over that because this is a business. It's going to be a business. It's not going to go back to the way it was. You're not going to have the days where Rye is like bowing at the ultra's feet with the jersey and you just that stuff it's not the 19 you know what i mean like and there's a lot of fans that i interact with where it's like it's not the 1990s anymore it's not that world that world is gone it's dead we've been re- and we've replaced it with something else and you might think that it's worse you might think that it'd be better if we had these players that stayed at clubs and were loyal and only cared about playing and all that stuff and that the endorsements weren't involved and that we could just go back to the simpler time and that everything that's new is bad. Like we got to move on from that because it ain't going back. And Neymar is the new normal. And I, we, we talked about it in that podcast I did with Chase about Neymar that if you haven't listened to it might be good to go back and listen to it. I'm sure it's in the archives somewhere. Yeah. It was a PSG small talk special when that was a thing. But, R.I.P. Yeah, but it had its time. But it it's like there it, you're not gonna. It's gonna be more players like Neymar, and you're gonna have to learn to deal with that and understand it and realize that this is a business. And as shitty as he treated these fans, and as horribly as he did it, it's over. Move on. Well, in that long rant, you definitely gave me the name for this podcast. What is the point of the ultras? <laughs> I oh, think no, that might. That, you're getting me in trouble now. <laughs> no, I won't do that. I won't do that to you. Um, I thought that was a great main event. Let's go ahead and wrap this episode up. We're coming on an, up on an hour here, so let's just right. move right into questions from listeners. So, at Kalavai underscore Rish Abba, I think I got that right. He had a great question. He wants to know. What do you think should be the name of our attack? They offered up Le Quadrant. And I also, so you mentioned wrestling. I'm going to throw two wrestling ideas out, and you tell me what you think. The NWO. No, the if four- we, tried that, we, we tried that. It didn't stick with the last Okay. One. What about the Four Horsemen? A little old school. I don't think. I, do, do, they need, do they deserve it yet? I don't know if they deserve it yet, because there's like five of them now. Yeah. Like there's Di Maria. There's like f- there's like five of them. It, it, it's more like <clears throat> it's more like the NWO in the 99 when they had like two groups and like 20 members of it. <laughs> so like I don't know if we're at that point yet, but I don't think they need a name for it. Like 
like they shouldn't have like we tried the you know that horrible MCN where it's like why do we have to be Barcelona ripoffs? I don't want yeah. to be Barcelona Junior. Like that's why I wanted to call them the NWO, which was it was perfect at the time. Yeah. But nobody went with it because they were too cowardly to go with it. So I, I think they don't deserve it. They should be the attack with no name. How about the indifference? Like, yeah, the the indifference. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's move the on to the, the mercenaries. We can, the mercenaries, the Hessians. Yes. Um, well, at Christian C123 wants to know Navas or Adrisa Gay, wh- who has been the better signing? Now, Navas has only played in one game for us, so it's kind of hard, but which one do you think is going to be the better signing? Navas. Oh, yeah, definitely. Just from a little bit. Adrisa Gay can affect the game in so many ways, but. Navas is uh, Idrissa Gay is replacing what we already had. We, we had a guy like him. We had Blaise Matuidi, and then we let him go because we thought Adrian Rabio was going to be his replacement, and that didn't work out as anyone planned. So, yeah. But we've ne- we haven't had a guy like Navas in 20 years. So absolutely Navas. Navas is a game changer in that way. Absolutely. So at Finland, PSG wants to know in a situation where all players are available, who would you play as our back four or three if you went that way? Uh, he said Diallo played well on Saturday, but would be more useful on the left side um, as he was in the end. I think you go with a back four. I like Juan Bernat. I like Marquinhos. I like Thiago Silva. And why the hell not? Let's let's throw in um, Dagba as a right back. If he's injured, Tilo Kerr. Those are my two right backs. That's my back four. I would say similarly, although I didn't mention this in our Madrid preview, but I think that Tuchel might go with Marquinhos as a defensive mid in this mm. game. I just have a feeling he might go Marquinhos, Verratti, and Guille and just be a little more defensive and then play Silva and Diallo back there. And Because Diallo's shown that he can at least play at somewhat of that level, or even Kimpembe goes in that spot. But my back four would be Marquinhos, Silva, Bernat, and Dagba. I like it. Although Our- I think Dagba had an average game on uh, Saturday, I think he needs to be a little more confident in crossing the ball. Uh, too many times he sort of dribbled it and passed it back. But, yeah, he uh, that would be my four. Okay. Our friend uh, at it's underscore James Carter, he wants to know, and we talked about it a little bit already, but how should Tuchel play Icardi and Cavani up front? Who subs and at what point in the match? So I guess he's asking, you know, can you do both of them or maybe one at a time? And we kind of talked about maybe put both of them up front if Cavani is healthy um but I think at this point if you have an opportunity I would play um I would I would go with Icardi starting over Cavani maybe bring in Cavani at the one hour mark something like that let him have 30 minutes to make a difference I think that Icardi should start I don't see any reason why he should sit on the bench behind Edinson Cavani even if the ultras are chanting his name for 90 minutes in a row I, I don't – Edinson Cavani is a washed-up player. Like – and I don't even mean that as an insult. He's just washed up. Like, yeah. he's had three muscular injuries in the last year. He got an injury kicking the ball into the stands. He got an injury taking a penalty. Like, this is not – these are not injuries that healthy players get or that young players get. These are injuries that players who have their legs shot get because they don't have their legs under them. So it's clear you start a Cardi. Like, that's not even a question. Yeah. It's just, can Edinson Cavani come in in the last 20 minutes of a game and provide you with something off the bench? I would say he can. I think if you have that attack, I think it should be Neymar, Mbappe, and a Cardi, and that's it. And if you, depending on the game, Di Maria can come in there, or, you know, Di Maria can come in as like a fourth guy in like a 4 2 3 1. Or, you know, or you do something else with that. But I think if Neymar, Mbappe, and Icardi aren't all on the field, I think that's a malpractice. That's a malfeasance on, tu- on Tuchel's part. Agreed. No, because it's just Icardi does all the things. Well, the only thing Icardi doesn't do that Neymar can do is the defensive work. And that's overrated anyway. Like, and we've got players for that. We do. We should have players for that. If you have – if you're – if your striker's going back to defend like that, it, it's usually not a good thing. <laughs> We've got bigger problems. Do, it's like when your safety in football makes like 16 tackles in a game. 
your safety is not making 16 tackles in a game because your front line is doing so well, you know, or it's, it, 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 you know what I mean? Like, that's not what it should be. Like, he should not be playing defense that much. So, yeah, I just – I don't see – and the things that they both have in common, the hunting the ball down in the box, Mario Riccardi is just a better version of that, a younger, better version of that right now. Yep. So, we, we traded up for a better model, so – I think – no, that's kind of what this is to me. It's not yeah, we, just discard a club legend, but at some point, Jesus Christ, the guy can't get on the field without tearing his hamstring. Like, Riccardi you know, – Icardi is the equivalent to the iPhone 11 Pro Max, and Cavani is like the iPhone 6S. We're, we've upgraded. We got the two-year plan. Actually, it's a one-year plan because Icardi could go back if we don't want to buy him. So, yeah, I'm excited. I also wanted to mention that we have a new exciting feature coming up for the Real Madrid game. So we've got – we're calling it PSG Talkback. And basically what this is, is what this is going to be is your opportunity – to have your say, and we're going to feature it on the PSG Talk website. So record a little video, send it to us, we'll put it on our YouTube channel and share it. So that's a way that you can share your opinion. I, we only have so many – we can't create podcasts for everybody. So this is a way for for you to have your say on our platform essentially. So we're going to send out information about that on Facebook, on Twitter, um, everywhere else, Instagram, YouTube, at PSG Talk. You'll find us. So look for that. We'll have more information about that coming up. Mark, do you have anything? Also, apologies if you hear my dog in the background. Uh, he just woke up from a long nap. Um, he's getting tired of this listening to this podcast. So he's like, come on, it's time to go out. So none of the audience <laughs> is getting tired. Yeah. So we, we've already gone it's an hour and ten dog. minutes None here. of the audience is tired. They, they want us to go longer, but we're, we're, we're <laughs> cutting it off now to leave them wanting more. Let's go ahead and get out of here. Um, thank you all for being the best part about PSG Talk. We hope that you enjoyed this episode of the 1970. And Mark, why don't you go ahead and hit them with your famous line? Well, I got three things to say. You can follow me at Mark Damon one. I want everyone to follow their dreams. <laughs> and I'll say au revoir for now.